Okay, thank you. Good morning from Uppsala. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, uh, I want to talk about capacity building in Indonesia, uh, navigating around uh, uh, from the, you know, uh, between linguistics research, my own interest, and also the interest of the community, uh, and, and how we kind of do, do our research uh, for the benefit of uh, the, the speech community in particular. So I have more slides than I need, so I'll skip some of them. I wanna go through, uh, first of all, giving you some basic uh, background uh, in terms of dealing with diversity in Indonesia and then uh, I outlined the challenges faced by minority speech community uh, in communities in Indonesia in the context of modern uh, Indonesia. And then I'll talk more about embedding linguistic research in language documentation uh, as part of the capacity building, mainly on the basis of my own experience uh, work, working with local communities in Indonesia. So first of all, as you know, uh, Indonesia is uh, a big country with uh, very rich ethno-linguistic resources, uh, one of the world's uh, super diverse regions, uh, home to over 700 languages, uh, Papuan and uh, Australian languages. And as you see, uh, the minority uh, speech communities uh, constitute uh, almost uh, one third of those uh, you know, ethnic uh, minorities in Indonesia. So in terms of the uh, documentation so far has been done uh, mainly uh, on the languages in uh, Western part of Indonesia, even though the uh, proportion of the languages in Indonesia, mostly, uh, you know, over 75% of the languages are on the eastern side, the central eastern side of Indonesia, but the documentation has been done mainly on the basis of uh, languages in Western Indonesia. This has some sort of historical dimension on it, uh, partly, I think, due to the uh, center of the political kind of, uh, you know, in Indonesia, the, the politics in Indonesia, the Western part of Indonesia. So this is just give you some uh, background, uh, traditional uh, documentation in Indonesia has been done as, you know, far back in the 19th century, mainly done by, <coughs> excuse me, by missionaries. Uh, in Western Indonesia, and then also in Central Indonesia, in Flores and other part of Indonesia, and also in Eastern Indonesia uh, by uh, Father Peter Drabe, Drabe, okay. And also uh, in the late 60s uh, to the early 2000s, SIL, Summer Institute of Linguistics, uh, also works in Indonesia. And on the basis of the statistics uh, that I just checked uh, earlier, uh, they have published over 1500 publications, mainly on the grammar, but also other kind of issues, uh, uh, for example, in terms of, uh, including social linguistics and also uh, literacy uh, and education. But their main uh, purpose, I think, they, they want to translate Bibles to uh, local languages in Indonesia. The government, uh, through the agency called, uh, you know, the uh, Badan Bahasa earlier, but now Badan Pengembangan Pembinaan Bahasa, the Language Development and Fostering Agency, uh, they also have done a lot of language documentation traditionally. But again, uh, the focus uh, typically is still on the, uh, the grammatical side uh, of uh, the language system. And in the past two decades, uh, we have modern language documentation projects in Indonesia, uh, four Dobes projects, Volkswagen projects, uh, and also the LDP projects, uh, including mine, the, Ron the Ronga language documentation project in Flores, and also Marori, uh, in uh, Merauke, Western, uh, the West Papua, part of Indonesian West Papua, and then also recently 
<clears throat> I have two Engano projects uh, with uh, Mary uh, from Oxford University. So uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, in this uh, capacity building issues in Indonesia, uh, mainly based on my uh, three uh, projects that I've been working on in, in Flores, in Merauke, and also uh, in Engano. All right. So let me uh, provide you with these challenges that uh, faced by local communities, particularly minority speech communities in Indonesia, uh, mainly because of the uh, changes, uh, non-linguistic changes uh, happening in the past uh, several decades in Indonesia. And first of all, uh, on the political dimension, we see the impact of language, uh, language policy uh, that has been in place, uh, mainly triggered by the uh, the central government's uh, part of this, uh, you know, the policy uh, national strategic issues uh, imposing uh, with the goal of uh, unifying a national, uh, you know, the, the, to unify Indonesia, so imposing the policy that uh, mainly, which is mainly driven by uh, political considerations, uh, which has then uh, impact on the uh, well-being of the local languages, okay? Uh, for example, the use of Indonesian uh, as a national language, as a formal language, and, and imposed uh, quite harshly during the Suharto's uh, government. And we will see uh, the use of Indonesian will uh, remain in place like that as part of the strategy of the central government in its nation building effort to control the ter territorial automation maintain the territorial uh, national integrity of the uh, Indonesian state. So this uh, has the negative impact uh, on the ground with the accelerated marginalization and then endangerment of Indonesia's minority uh, uh, languages in recent decades. Uh, related to that, uh, because of this focus of the uh, economy as well, uh, the building uh, of uh, the infrastructure roads and connecting all the islands across Indonesia. So we see the increased migration, uh, which result in the cheap transportation. Uh, and, you know, uh, because of the uh, economic reasons, uh, and we have new op economic opportunities. And this also has the uh, negative impact on the local uh, communities. Uh, minority communities in particular, because we see accelerated mobility and then intensified uh, contacts uh, to uh, in uh, places uh, which are previously not accessible uh, to the outsiders. So we see, uh, for example, this is in uh, Mopa Airport Merauke, close to the Marori, now we have quite modern uh, airport there, uh, quite different from the one 10 years ago when I first visited that place. So what we see, uh, you know, the local communities, minority communities in particular, they are facing immense uh, pressures uh, com in competition with non-locals and then uh, language, uh, the impact on a local minority in particular, their language, it's just this side thing and, and the local people, uh, the, the main concerns of the local people are not really uh, their language, the fate of their language, but rather their local, uh, you know, basic needs. So uh, with that background, uh, my experience is that uh, I can identify when we wanna help the local communities uh, to face their challenges in modern Indonesia, at least we have this, uh, issue, these issues, content issues, participation issues, sport issues. And the, the last one is the capacity building issues uh, related to the leadership, local leadership issues. I just wanna focus on the, the last part. Okay, so this brings us to uh, the idea, you know, if you wanna help the local community, uh, linguists usually go to the field uh, only briefly or only in limited kind of uh, with limited resources with specific goals in mind. So what we need, and I think this is the challenge is to trigger or to facilitate uh, the emergence of local agents, which you, uh, to whom you uh, kind of 
talk uh, or kind of discuss what should you do uh, if you want to help the local community. So, uh, but then uh, we have done training across Indonesia in terms of language documentation or any other trainings across the world in terms of language documentation, but leadership is not actually or hasn't been fully incorporated into uh, the language documentation training uh, workshop. This is Ten part minutes of the left. Training. 10 minutes, okay, good. So I've done uh, locally uh, doing a town hall meeting uh, and also uh, with local people uh, trying to uh, train them uh, how to uh, lead, you know, especially the young generations and how to motivate the local uh, agents. Uh, just one example, uh, I managed to uh, train and educate a local uh, agent, the, my, my research assistant in Merauke uh, called, uh, his name is Agustinus Mahosi, and we built on the ethnobiology, uh, biological kind of documentation, and then building on that, uh, we have uh, non-linguistic programs incorporating, uh, making use of the uh, findings in you know documentation of local uh, ethnobiology and developing recreation centers, swimming facilities, and other things, and also have this uh, and hills uh, and and you know you have this uh, kind of uh, on the basis of the model in Bali because you know part of this uh, uh, documentation process I invited the local uh, young uh, assistant in Merauke to Bali and and having comparative study in Bali and developing uh, objects uh, like this one, recreation center uh, building on that and with uh, ethnobiological component in it. So that's from the uh, local perspective, but from the, uh, from the linguistics, uh, from the linguist perspective, we need also to embed, uh, kind of incorporate our research and how to frame our project such that it benefits both the academic and local community. I just wanna highlight that there are different dimension on this uh, from the linguist side of things, grammatical, uh, lexical dimension, whatever dimension that we wanna have uh, on the basis of our own interest, uh, ideally, those dimensions intersect with the community uh, dimension. So just want to go briefly. Uh, so my publication uh, on the basis of, for example, the downloads, uh, you know, the statistics, uh, it turns out that the dictionary uh, online has been downloaded at the most kind of, you know, the highest downloads number uh, from the uh, and uh, because now our local communities also have access to internet across Indonesia. So it seems to me that something that it has been, you know, in the mind of the people locally, they, they want to use our findings for the local literacy, for example, that's uh, actually true. And then from the uh, other dimension, uh, we need to uh, look at the sociolinguistic, cultural, political dimension at different locals. Even though not much can we do uh, on the basis of uh, because you know such change uh, might be imposed externally or top down by the policies, but at least uh, we see, for example, the idea of uh, distinctive ideology, uh, local ideology, in, in relation to uh, the motivation, how uh, you know uh, we instigate the active particip participation of the locals. Uh, knowing that and, 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 and navigating around with different uh, layers of policies in Indonesia would be beneficial in order to be able to help the local community. Just want to skip this one uh, because of the time. I'm very concerned about, I'm very aware of this, but I just want to say something uh, about uh, my recent uh, Finding uh, the idea of uh, the territorial integrity. This is the uh, village uh, of the Marori people. Uh, now the dots represent the non-locals already kind of coming in and live in the village, uh, which then has 
a negative impact, a significant impact actually, weakening the, the social networks uh, of the locals uh, to the effect that, you know, the, the language that is used as, uh, you know, lingua franca now, of course, we know the Indonesian is increasingly so, but even in the, at the most local level, the village of Kampung Wasur, because of the growing number of non-locals uh, living there, uh, then the local language uh, Marori is no longer used as a language of uh, communication, even among the local or young generation in the village uh, among the Marori people. So it's not surprising that uh, Indonesian is used now by young- Five minutes to go. Okay, uh, thanks. So uh, that's uh, expected in a way. So what I wanna highlight the point here in relation to uh, the identity. So this is something uh, we need to highlight identity, language identity or ethnic identity uh, and the motivation of the locals to maintain uh, identity, the language uh, you know, as, as part of it. But my finding uh, having this comparative study across Indonesia, uh, in particular with minority language, uh, languages, uh, comparing there is one in uh, Western uh, Bali called Loloan Malay, uh, quite uh, you know, small, like uh, Engano, for example, around 1,500 people, but their ethno-linguistic identity or fatality is very high. Uh, compared to other minorities in Indonesia. So what is surprising here is that subjective reporting, uh, even though both uh, the, uh, the Engano people, for example, say that language is really important for their uh, identity. Uh, so you, you see, you know, the across generation, they agree that Engano all over my life, the, the, you know, language is, language is very important. But what distinguishes them and why, for example, the Engano is low in their fatality and, and the uh, Lolan Malay is high, is the coupling of the identities. You have multiple identities where religion is very, very important. Okay, so all Malay, Lolan Malay people are Muslim. They, they, they have this, uh, identities uh, kind of need uh, needed uh, to distinguish themselves from the Balinese who are Hindu. So this coupling of language identity and um, the religious identity at local level, distinguishing themselves from the other or neighboring uh, ethnic uh, identity. So it's very important to see that uh, we have multiple identities, the, the more identities merging together, making the language identity as, uh, you know, being, being important rather than just simply language identity. So um, now briefly, uh, before I just wanna, before I still have five minutes or less, uh, the community engagement uh, in the context of um, uh, work, uh, COVID as part of uh, engagement with the local community. Uh, prior to COVID, uh, you know, we have uh, in-situ face-to-face engagement, but uh, during the break, a part of my Engano project, we have we, we did it uh, fully online. Uh, and here are uh, uh, some of the pictures uh, with the local, but the problem, Yangano is a very remote island, you know, in, uh, you know, off the coast of Sumatra. And we didn't have, and even now we don't have uh, internet connection. So what we do, uh, you know, uh, we, even now we invite uh, the elders to go to the Sumatra island of Bengkulu and we have our remote uh, Zoom uh, from uh, Sumatra. Uh, and then uh, the other uh, mode of uh, field work is the proxy mode. So we uh, have local research assistant and research collaborators in Bengkulu. Bengkulu is uh, one of the provinces in Indonesia. So we collaborate with uh, university staff members, linguists there, and then we, we sent them to Engano Island and do a field work on our behalf. So uh, COVID uh, restrictions uh, provide opportunities, uh, you know, for locals 
uh, including our uh, research collaborators, university lectures, part of our project to have greater roles uh, in doing research. But challenges still, uh, you know, enormous there because uh, skills and authority of the chief investigators, in particular me, uh, when, you know, it is not always possible to transfer that skill and authority and exercise by the local research assistant or even the local research collaborator from Bengkulu, for example. So I still see the need for the face-to-face -face, uh, you know, presence of chief investigators, uh, somebody like me in the field, uh, in particular, for example, when we do um, uh, focus group discussion, certain follow-up uh, uh, complex uh, research questions, uh, you need somebody who has, uh, uh, you know, good uh, linguistic training and in, 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 in long term, uh, it should be done through formal education and particular, I think in particular, uh, the uh, research collaborator of, of the university there. So in summary, uh, so Indonesia provides, uh, you know, ample opportunities for linguistic research, given the diversity of resources there. Uh, and uh, we see uh, that minority uh, speech communities have been increasingly under pressure because of the uh, current development uh, beyond uh, linguistics, a complex situation in Indonesia. So there are good reasons to bundle language documentation uh, project with local capacity buildings, uh, even though we have our own interests, uh, academic papers to publish, uh, and different sort of interests in terms of academic uh, career, our career, but uh, we should help the local community uh, to cope with uh, language endangerment and do something uh, locally. And I, I argue that capacity building uh, is very critical, uh, and the, the hardest part is the the you know the the motivation, uh, how you instigate a strong motivation uh, on the part of the local uh, leaders. But it's not just simply linguistics. So you, we need more than uh, training the locals uh with the uh, ability or skills uh to upskill their ability in doing documentation and the current development in covid uh covid 19 travel restrictions uh create new opportunities for doing linguistic field work remotely uh, either through online uh, we talk to the uh, language consultants through zooms or sending our local uh, collaborators to the field but uh, post-COVID, I will, you know, I think uh, I see the need uh, still face-to-face -face field work uh, because you cannot replicate uh, the real face-to-face -face field work done by uh, chief investigators, somebody like me, uh, in order to be able to have a deep uh, level of engagement uh, inside and inside from the field. Okay, so I just stop it there and want to get feedback if you have any. Thank you.